And we are now recording. This is the second panel discussion around uh, global information literacy. We have a nice group here. So Leslie Farmer, Helen, Peter, Deepa, and Maha. Um, we're going to let each of them do a short presentation, and we're just going to go in, this, in the order in my screen here. So, Leslie, I'm going to let you go. And am I still screen sharing? Do I need to let that go, or is it gone? I will now share my screen. Perfect. So, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Dr. Leslie Farmer. I teach uh, teacher librarians in educational technology. And what I want to uh, share in my uh, few minutes is a website. Uh, fake news that I developed to maintain and the simple URL for that is tinyurl.com slash fake news libguide and I'm going to ask everybody else to mute themselves. Great. So I'm just going to do a quick walk through, you know, on here so that you know what kind of uh, materials are in this uh, resource. Almost all of them are uh, digital. So in this, uh, because fake news is a, a kind of a low hanging fruit as a way to discuss uh, media literacy. So in there, in here I kind of like define uh, fake news and differentiate it from different kinds of misleading information. Uh, what are some of the realities? What are the consequences on it? Uh, I go into kind of the background, the history of it, the information cycle, <coughs> who creates it, why, how it's disseminated, how people access and use it. Um, and then uh, go into kind of discerning fake news. So uh, while well, we talked earlier, uh, the idea of how we internalize fake news, how we you know, get attracted to it and then sometimes own it and, and share it, sort of especially kind of the psychological pieces, you know, on there. And then uh, flip right into the ideas of what are strategies to uncover fake news, to address it. And I also have a number of, um, down here of uh, fact checking tools um, and ways as I say to sort of like quote fix uh, fake news. Probably the thing that's most interesting for us today is just the concept that there's a lot of literacies that are involved when we're talking about uh, fake news and how to discern it. So you know if you want to talk about you know kind of a, the circles of it you know starting with like news literacy and then we talk about you know that that's a subset of um, media literacy and that it largely overlaps information literacy uh, digital literacy is also kind of a component so in each of these cases that i have you know articles about it and learning activities in order to hone that and as part of the media literacy piece then i also have a section uh, on there that talks about advertising and how um, folks that are creating fake news oftentimes use you know, advertising techniques. Um, I do differentiate between media literacy and visual literacy and I do have a section just on that as well as on digital literacy and numeracy. So that's kind of what this page you know deals with. Um, I also uh, have in here the idea of civic engagement and how um, you know, media literacy and fake news kind of impacts uh, civic engagement. And so I have a section that's on civic um, education as well as digital citizenship. Then I have one page that's on curriculum, sort of general curriculum that has to do with fake news. And then uh, some curriculum guides about a coping, scope and sequence for middle school and high school, which is also useful for undergrads. A couple of um, presentations, some tips on instruction, as well as some nifty uh, videos on fake news. And because my background is library science, then um, you know, how librarians deal with it, how they collaborate with others, some um, uh, nice uh, library guides, those are all from university level. And I guess the last thing that I want to say about fake news, and I think that it fits with media literacy in general, is um, this is just a really simple deal that works for primary school all the way through, you know, 102. And that is when you're thinking, when you're looking at news is to basically look up, in other words, find the source, to uh, look across, so what other folks, you know, are doing, and um, look into, so your own biases as well. So that's kind of a, um, a simple, you know, way to, to think about it. So with that, 
Um, Lovely. Enjoy the site. So again, it's uh, tinyurl.com and it's one word, fake news lib guide. Thank you. Terrific. And I will stop sharing. So Leslie, one of the things that came up this morning was that, that these are uh, issues that have been common to humanity forever. Absolutely. They're being magnified by the moment, Precisely. but they're not necessarily new. Absolutely. And that's why I have a whole section on there. And I did have to forget to say one thing on that, kind of like you're looking up across and inside, and that is through. And that is too often we just look at the headlines and we know that if an image is right by that headlines, it even gets more attention. Just go to AOL or Bing and you can tell that. And so um, two thirds of folks have at some point, you know, shared an article by just looking at the headline. And again, as you say, you know, those headlines have been around since, you know, before the sixth century BC. They were doing it in Byzantium. You and I someday have to talk in depth about Edward Bernays. Did we already do that? Not yet. So we have something. To oh my about. gosh, so much fun. We'll wait till the chat time. There we go. Okay, so oh, Helen. Actually, I have to go. Oh, you got to go. Yeah, I have a meeting at three, so. Okay, look up Edward Bernays. He was Sigmund Freud's double nephew. And he took Freud's ideas of the subconscious, wrote a book called Propaganda. Mm, oh, he, yeah. He started the women's smoking movement in a brilliant maneuver that mimicked the Statue of Liberty in the Easter Day Parade. He did all of these things, the piano in every home, the bacon eggs breakfast. Yes, fascinating, yeah. Fascinating yeah. guy. Right, my yeah. cousin was in advertising for 30 years. So yes, I can't remember the name, but I certainly remember the stuff and the same thing about have cereal and that whole, you know, how we changed our breakfast um, habit. So another, you know, uh, David Ogilvy is another one, Saul Bass. So there is quite a few folks that have been very influential in that area. Yep. Hey, thank you, Leslie. When you Absolutely. disappear, we appreciate Take you. Care. Thank Helen, you. Helen, you ready? I think so. Can you see what I'm seeing? Yes, we think so. We're seeing I'm your loading. Material. Okay, there we go. Um, I just have a few slides to go through. I'm uh, Helen Teague, and I've taught and lived uh, online, which is its own little country, and then, of course, uh, globally. Uh, I ask my uh, graduate students, who are all practicing teachers in the field, the key things that they wanted me to share uh, about SEPA. Several of them uh, register for the conference, so if they are on this site, you get credit. But anyway, um, so here are some of the things that they shared as well. Um, when we talk about SEPA, the main word that we are looking at is protection. And uh, here's some of the prism of the problem. And usually I don't use the word problem, but we are going to use that intentionally here. Uh, my bias going in is that there needs to be a variety of sources for information that we present to students and the silos that have the least profit motive may be the ones of greatest value uh, to them. The internet is one of those silos, but it does not replace many other sources, print, conversation, uh, oral storytelling, and so forth. But here's the prism of the problem. There's 2.2 uh, billion people just on Facebook alone who spend 50 minutes a day on there. If you don't have a Facebook account, then someone's spending your time there. Kids spend an average of 10 to 12 hours a day. Adults are not far behind. And this was uh, from a recent book. TikTok, which is the app, uh, who knows about TikTok? It's the app that kids absolutely love. It now has over 1.5 billion downloads, which is more than Instagram, which used to be their last minute uh, favorite. But TikTok has recently, as uh, recent as November 1st, come under a national security investigation. Uh, and I've given you the link there. I have all these links on a tiny URL that I'll share at the end. Our main concern with information that hit kids or that kids are exposed to is the possibility of behavior shifting algorithms. So my key takeaway before we get any further 
is that the best algorithm for students is a discerning teacher who provides many resources for information acquisition. SEPA itself is an American law, but it does have application to other areas globally. Uh, it mainly deals with inappropriate content, safe communication, hacking and phishing. It's been updated recently to have protections for personal information. Um, as many know, uh, institutions that take E-rate funding must comply with SEPA. Um, internet filters and blocking becomes one of the main areas of concern with SEPA. And so again, as we look to silos and we look to opening communications with those who hold the whitelists and, and uh, features of blocking, it's important to see uh, where we can have the greatest influence. There are roles that everybody plays within SEPA administration. Even students play a role and should be included in any discussion of the information that they see or do not see. Parents and guardians as well. Um, take a look at this message. If you've been out to internet, I'm sorry, if you've been out to YouTube recently, you have been asked to comply, either agree or disagree with this message. And YouTube and several other uh, video sharing sites are being uh, more vigilant about complying with the left-hand side or the left hand of SEPA, which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act or COPPA. And so you may see this, uh, students may see this, but uh, you have to now, when you upload videos to YouTube uh, and to Vimeo, you have to declare if your video is made for kids or not. Um, so we begin to ask them, what can we do to protect kids? What can we do to uh, give them a robust exposure to information, but also protect them uh, while they're online? I particularly like uh, societies such as ISTE. Uh, I like standards such as the Nets for Teachers and ISTE standards. Uh, I like trusted sources of information. Um, and on the link that I'll show you in a minute, we have some sites uh, for that as well. What we're seeing then is a chance to have a dialogue of a larger scope about digital, citizen, digital citizenship, which goes across global environments. Vicki Davis, who is, is a, a well-respected member of GEC and uh, the author of Flattened Classrooms, has written that the strongest ally for students is teachers who arm their students with knowledge of common electronic crime issues of the day and teach their students steps to take this also extends to offline content too. And so it is a discernment process that's involved. I like these ideas for helping students to learn about SEPA, allow them to teach internet safety to each other and to the adults in the room. Give them a, a profile at city councils and PTAs. Uh, give collaborative learning opportunities and have students practice identifying uh, fake sites. Um, here's the link to even more information and the resources that I've shared and also some resources that we use that have been crafted toward the standards that specify SEPA and it's tiny URL, SEPATIG, GEC. Okay, that's what I've got. Awesome. Okay, and if you'd put that link in the chat, that would be great because these I links- I will definitely do that. They're not hot on the screen. I, I would definitely do that. Maha, did you want to go ahead? 
Enjoy. Yes, uh, I'd like to go ahead. Yes, I can share my screen. Yes. Shall I share my screen? You're welcome to. Okay. Can you see this? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, is it so much. Uh, I agree with her that uh, it's uh, is uh, the teacher. Uh, the teacher, uh, if the teacher is cultured enough, the teacher can help the, uh, and is aware of what's really going around concerning the internet and concerning uh, the act of children production and uh, so protection. I'm sorry, and the act of how to help students. Um, to be aware of what they should look uh, go through on the internet and uh, what not and how to protect themselves this is one of the most important points so it's the teacher again or the professor who is uh, supposed to be responsible for this because otherwise uh, sometimes the students get confused maybe the parents they don't give good attention to this and sometimes they can differentiate between what's good and what's bad online so I believe it's the responsibility of uh, it's the educational side of uh, the responsibility of uh, the educational system again whether it's in at school or uh, at college uh, the second point which I'd like to raise um, uh, it's raising the student awareness of having a positive role in society uh, uh, when we help the students like uh, this idea of the act of production again when uh, somebody is loading something on the internet and they have to ask him a number of questions so it gives uh, the people the sense of responsibility that they have to be aware of what they are really putting for those children how they how is this going to affect a whole generation uh, because this is so viral on the internet and the people uh, the children can be so much affected and the youth in general can be affected by such a thing different kinds of different kind of own colleagues uh, about what's good and what's bad and how they can uh, find their way out uh, through this dilemma and on the uh, and so uh, according to this if they are going to be have a positive role in society this means that they are going to get the sense of Maha, your internet's going in and out for us. I'm going to turn off your video, but we'll leave the slides up. Maybe that will help. Did we lose you? What are they supposed to do? And uh, how they can help people to understand the different problems uh, going on around the world and how to have a positive role in doing that. Uh, another point is uh, um, the slides are somehow yes uh, helping the students uh, how to search online again um, uh, how how to go through the internet and what to to go through and what not to and uh, they have to be uh, um, uh, aware about uh, about different fake uh, websites and uh, as uh, uh, Helen has just mentioned the idea that uh, young children spend from 10 or children spend from 10 to 12 hours uh, per week online so this is very critical so we have uh, to help them uh, to be aware of what they are really going through and how and what uh, and um, that 10 to 12 hours is too much uh, online and how they can use their time in a much better way than just wasting their time going through chats and games and so on uh, these are the three main points that I wanted to raise uh, through this discussion. Thank you so much. Okay, you go ahead and stop sharing your slides. Peter, it's nice to see you. We weren't sure if you were there or not, but we're going to let Deepa go and then we'll let you go. Um, okay, so uh, how should I do it? I'm sorry, I'll stop sharing. Now. Yes. Thank you, Maha. You're welcome. You're muted, Deepa. The bottom left of your screen, you're going to click on the microphone. There you go. Am I good? Okay. All right. 
Hi everyone, so my name is Deepa Gopal. Uh, I'm the founder of Young Zine. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in two different countries, in India and Kuwait, before I came to the US for grad school. Um, so, you know, having grown in different countries, I think there was a certain perspective that I had growing up as well. And then, of course, I was also raised in a family where, you know, my grandfather would, even on summer vacations, ask me if I read the newspaper. Uh, you know, and he would just ask a question just to test if I'd read it. So, you know, growing up in that, I was always very aware of what was happening around the world. Um, so when I came here to grad school, I did engineering. Um, looking back, Steve, I attended the gap session yesterday, and I wish there was a concept like gap year back then. Uh, but uh, growing up, it was just two options, you know, engineering or medicine uh, as career options. And I guess that's kind of what led me into, you know, engineering and, uh, you know, to the U.S. here. Uh, but, you know, right through, I've always been passionate about working with children. So I used to volunteer with, uh, you know, programs here locally that would work with kids and try to help them in reading and math literacy. And then back in 2010, when my son was just entering middle school, 2011 or so, that's when I kind of realized that I wanted him to also realize what I had grown up with that realization that, you know, I'm part of a a larger world that you know we really are a global citizen and as more and more as our world gets interconnected you know we're no longer living in silos and really helping him understand that you know um his responsibility is much larger than just you know growing up in a very privileged society and a privileged family and he had all the options and i wanted to build that understanding in him so with that in mind i was looking for something back in 2011 and i couldn't find a source you know, I started Young Zine. So that's sort of the story behind the genesis of Young Zine. And what we do at Young Zine is really a platform where we are bridging the gap between the classroom and the real world uh, in our youth. And we're providing a platform for their, where they're uh, learning, exploring, and discovering their role as global citizens. So um, how do we do that on Young Zine? Um, so one is, of course, you know, we take news articles. Line. So we really use news as a hook to kind of go into the underlying context about why did we get here today? It's really getting kids to think beyond the headlines, kind of peeling the layers of the onion and asking the kind of questions that, you know, the who, what, where, when, why sort of questions. So it's really building those kind of skills, critical thinking skills in our kids and, and global awareness. Um, we also have the second uh, part of Young Zine is a platform where we have a you write section where we have our middle school readers, um, they submit articles that are published. Uh, and our third arm are, is our expert series where we bring people who are in industry or in academia and who talk about how do they find their path to their uh, career. And you know, maybe it was a childhood passion, maybe it was a teacher who inspired them. But it's really, again, teaching kids that there's so many different career paths out there. And uh, really, it isn't the same binary one that I grew up uh, having to choose between. Um, the fourth element is uh, developing writing and journalism skills in high school students. So um, as we start, as the program started growing, um, you know, we were doing a couple of summer programs where we would get three to four, um, you know, young kids and we'd work with them. And then we realized that there was a huge interest in, um, in and, and really uh, doing this year round. So what we started doing from 2016 is really working with high school students who are interested in, creative writing or journalism. And we start working with them and have them take up a topic that's in the news and do what we do, which is really, you know, doing the, building the media literacy aspect of it, first of all, understanding how do you research, first of all, get different perspectives on the news. You know, I keep telling them, you know, not just the US perspective, you want to look at different parts of the world, how they are analyzing the same news story. And then go ahead and then you know, do some research on what is the context behind that, the, you know, the, the why, or why did we get here today if it's a political situation, or if it's a science behind a Nobel Prize, and looking at the science behind that and understanding it. And it's really making the connection to what kids are learning in their classroom. So we started building those skills, and today we've kind of um, mentored about 50 uh, students, some of whom have gone on to pursue journalism and uh, um, in college. Um, and, and really what I want to mention here is the fact that our writers keep coming back year after year. So it really shows the impact and the fact that it's actually making a difference for them. And of course, we also have a, a portal for teachers to create and manage uh, classroom assignments and, and spark discussions among their students. So really the three pillars of Young Zine, I believe, are probably what, to me, media literacy means. Um, 
of course, there's one thing is about finding the right sources and getting the right information. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, how do you connect what you're learning in your classroom to the real world? Um, how do you understand the context behind the news stories to be able to ask questions? I think that's a very, very important part of media literacy or information literacy. Um, and, and so to seek answers that are grounded in data, to be able to link events that are happening today to the past, um, and, and because history repeats itself. So really building that understanding and making connections between global and local. So these are kind of um, ideas that we work with um, with our writers as well. When they take an article, we ask them to uh, look into these. And of course, the goal is building skills such as you know an understanding of different cultures and opinions, um, and, and um, really understanding what is the common good um, and, and and our impact um, of the actions that we take and how that affects you know us and the ecosystems that we live in. Um, I just have a fun graphic right after, and I think this is not to mention any stereotypes here, but as much as to say how much, you know, how we are all boxed in our little, you know, islands and our perspectives and how that defines us. And in some sense, we get into these echo chambers. And I think some of that is what social media is exacerbating. And, you know, with, um, uh, you know, the news that it's in the Google the kind of news it sends to us or in Facebook groups. So it's really trying to go look outside and understand the other perspective. I think that is also going to be very important in trying to challenge uh, and handling some of the problems that our, uh, our kids are facing in the future. Um, so just a little bit about the impact that we've had. Uh, we're being used in about 1,000 classrooms around the world, uh, both online and offline. Uh, our partnerships with Gale and ProQuest expand the reach of our content. And uh, like I mentioned, we've uh, mentored quite a few young writers. So I think really what I want to leave with is a quote from one of our writers um, who said, you know, through Young Zine, I've learned how global events connect to the future and to ourselves, and they've become much more meaningful to me. So I think this is really important, and I really just want to leave with this message. Thanks. Awesome. So Peter, we didn't get a chance to hear from you earlier. Do you have a presentation you'd like to give? And your mic is muted. So down at the bottom left, you're looking for the microphone icon. Thank you, Deepa. You're welcome, Steve. Do you, did you put a link in the chat so people would know how to find out more about Youngzine? Okay. Hey there, Peter. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me okay? We can. Did you want to do a short presentation or do we go to conversation? Um, I do have, um, an, an image, uh, if, uh, if it's possible to share the desktop, I'm not quite sure how to do that, sorry. So look at the bottom of the screen, you're looking for the share button. All right, got you. That's it. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, I suppose basically uh, I greatly appreciate the invite, Steve, and um, I've not prepared as well as I might due to all sorts of circumstances the past fortnight, but um, it suffice to say uh, just to bring to you and the other people's attention uh, what what is a conceptual framework um, created in the 1980s by Brian Hodges. And um, this, this is ideal in terms of um, tackling a whole host of uh, situations, really, and that's the essence of it. So in the context of uh, media literacy and fake news, uh, this is ideal. Um, it, in a health context, we, we start from... Uh, who is the individual? Usually it's a patient or a carer. Um, we also have to deal with um, groups, uh, family, um, and the, the, the population nationally and even globally. And uh, what types of things do we do for the individual? Well, whether you're in the classroom or on a ward or a clinical arena, you're having to do things that are mechanistic in nature, uh, using technology for instance, but then also uh, humanistic, as one of the presenters already mentioned about empathy, uh, rapport. Um, 
this individual and group and the mechanistic and humanistic, as you can see illustrated, they give us the two main axes of the model. And um, Brian Hodges then went on to ask the question of what knowledge do we need to deliver these humanistic aspects of healthcare and the mechanistic aspects. And um, if, if you think of the sciences, um, they do tend to be uh, oriented towards um, sort of time, events, processes, um, sequence, uh, linear, um, and this uh, sciences domain includes all of the sciences. So whether it's nanotechnology, um, biology, physics, chemistry, of course, with drugs, medicines, x-ray. Um, so, and then compare that with um, the interpersonal. So you've got the emotional side of an individual's life and well-being, uh, mind, thoughts, beliefs, motivation. Uh, is that motivation intrinsic or is it extrinsic sort of thing? Um, mood, uh, in the UK at least and around the world globally of course, mental health is, uh, is being highlighted increasingly. And if you consider the notion of um, what's called parity of esteem, so if on the sciences side you've got physical health, then, you know, how, how much credence uh, funding and research is, uh, is spent on the mental and emotional health. And then looking at the group and population side, um, if you don't have order where groups are concerned, then um, chaos can reign. So um, the political domain tends to be um, sort of like rule driven, um, law and order, right and wrong, sort of uh, quite binary again as, uh, as already been referred to. So um, that, in, that can include aspects of uh, organizations, institutions, um, the, the nature of uh, the, 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 the student and uh, the value for money of their education sort of thing. And then finally, uh, the sociology domain, um, culture as has been brought up, uh, the, no the very notion of society, uh, which has been questioned on the political side and subject to ongoing debate. Um, so, that, that, that's sort of um, a, a quick snapshot, really. I've, I've probably not done uh, credit to uh, the range of this. Um, I'm, I'm currently uh, reading a book by uh, Ian Kinchin um, on sort of powerful knowledge and uh, expertise uh, in, in students developing that. So, um, in, in, in a way, in any future teaching uh, tutoring I may get to do, uh, I'd very much, uh, there is a Socratic process that you can go through, of course, whereby the student derives this model. And uh, I think that's one of the most powerful uh, ways of, of learning, obviously, uh, in the sense of self-discovery. So um, th there, is a, there is a blog um, that's actually got this uh, image included on, and there is a small uh, bibliography as well. And um, yeah, so I hope that's a help. Uh, so this is fascinating because I'm not sure this is what you intended, but for me, I'm beginning to see in each of these categories separate issues that relate to how we process information, the incentives to manage or control information, and how we communicate, right? So at, at, the, at the individual level, humanistics or interpersonal, we're clearly built with cognitive biases and limitations. There are things that we know we don't, we don't often think clearly. We, we have emotions, we have all kinds of ways in which we have to protect ourselves, right? So we talked earlier about trial by jury and innocent until proven guilty because our brains don't work perfectly. And then you get to the sociology and you have 
all the ways in which groups don't work perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you know you have uh, you have the the delusion of crowds, and you have uh, um, mentalities that can take place, and you have narratives that that spread because they're good at spreading, but not because they're necessarily true. And then political. So I've so I saw this within the framework, and maybe that's what you intended, of the, the different levels at which the 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 information literacy dialogue exists from the individual to the group right from the humanistic to the mechanistic that across all of these four quadrants there are things that we're trying to really figure out and be careful about and, and like we talked about earlier these are age-old concepts mm, yeah, yeah okay I think, so, I go think ahead. within within the model it's possible to uh, identify quite a few uh, dichotomies polarities so like with the mechanistic, of course, you've got the quantitative and uh, the objective. So, you know, politics is also always supposed to be, well, they talk about evidence-based science, don't they? And, you know, policy being based on evidence, but how often is that the case? Whereas on the humanistic side, um, it, it sounds like you're, you're alluding a bit to uh, like the, the fuzzy nature of uh, hu human existence sort of thing, you know, um, so that the subjective and uh, the qualitative. Peter, can I jump us right into the conversation piggybacking off of that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind, stop sharing your slides. And I'm going to ask kind of a hard question and see how the, the panelists respond. So, so one of the interesting things I think that happens is we see lots of examples of situations where there's been purposeful manipulation or there's been unconscious manipulation. Well, like we talked earlier about the tobacco situation and the, the things that were hidden, the agendas that were in the research that was hidden. And we've watched chemical companies and others do certain things. And we've watched individuals conspire with other individuals to accomplish certain goals. And yet, the moment somebody thinks critically, they're often accused of being a conspiracy thinker. And I'm like, okay, as an historian, history is filled with conspiracies. It's not a conspiracy, it's not conspiracy thinking to me to be a good critical thinker. Do any of the others of you feel like that's, what, what role is that playing and why? And, and how does it come about that sometimes critical thinking is actually a socially pushed away? Helen, Deepa, Maha, Peter, any ideas? Well, I'm popping my head back in. Um, sometimes I think if one veers away from a herd mentality that seems to be more and more prevalent in schools and in business, then that the one who wanders must be brought back into the herd. And I see more and more a herd mentality seeming to reign supreme. Whereas this is such a change from even 30 years ago where the individualist and the creative was celebrated. Yeah, and there's an interesting connection here too with the technologies, right? Like I never go on Facebook or Twitter anymore because I feel like they've turned into a mob that, the, that rather than sort of thoughtful discourse they're about the pressure of conforming to right. a set of beliefs. And I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. I did not expect this Web 2.0 into uh, internet technology to turn into kind of the, the digital democracy, the worst part of the digital democracy, the, the part that the American framers were worried about, that, you know, the democracies led to tyranny, that, that there was this, you know, that, that we were a, representative republic in the United States for fear of becoming a democracy. Well, it's like, oh, I, I can see that now. I can see how the, the mob mentality makes it hard, like even within ourselves. Deepa, I, I know you want to say something. Yeah, no, I was going to say the same thing that Helen was mentioning, which is I think people are just so comfortable in their bubbles just because there's so many forces, there's so much information they're not able to process in this online world. You're being bombarded with all kinds of information. And so at some point, you know, the safety and trying to be in groups 
sort of is probably just human nature that they kind of tend to be that. And I think it's really important that we build these skills in our kids to really start questioning what they're reading. And, you know, we've got to, you know, build those skills early. And I, I feel like I have hope in the next generation. I feel like, you know, a lot of the adults are probably, you know, some of them are probably already very cynical about where things are. But um, I think if you start building these skills in our kids where we get them to think and ask questions, I think that's going to be very key. Um, but, but you're right. Um, I think, like you said, asking a question is almost, um, you know, putting you as the person who's stirring trouble there. So, Well, well it is interesting. We, Go ahead, oh, Helen. I'm sorry. Well, I, I think we used to treat the iconoclast or the person with a different view, we used to say, tell me more. Mm -hmm. I, I tell, you know, how does this play out now? Now, instead of saying, tell me more, we almost say, tell me no more. I, I don't want to hear it. And Ellen, I, are you bad for asking? You're bad. Helen, in my experience, that's like in my own personal experience of me, I'm the least generous in listening to someone else or caring about their opinion when I'm the least in control of my own. Meaning in the areas of my life where I feel competent and thoughtful, I'm tolerant of someone thinking differently. I try to understand how to help them. I try to figure out what questions I can ask that would make a difference for them. Right. If you take the individual experience and you extrapolate to the group, it's almost like that's a sign of a lack of competence or understanding. We get emotional or have emotional responses when we don't feel in control. Now I want to make a tenuous argument here and tell me what you think. For the last 10, for the last 10 or 11 years, pretty much we've been lying about the economy, about what's going on really in the world. We, you know, we rescued the banks here in the United States. We didn't really do so in a democratic way. Whistleblowers have been jailed. There's a degree to which the world doesn't make sense like it did to me 15 or 20 years ago. Now, I'm not saying that it was any truer, but I felt a sense that the world had order, right? And now every day I'm faced with things that make me feel like I don't really understand what's going on. How can stocks keep going up? How can interest rates be so low? How can we be accumulating so much debt? And if I don't understand, I go into a little bit of a state of cognitive dissonance or, or, or confusion. And in my own experience, when I'm confused is when I'm the least capable of actually having a good conversation. So maybe there's a connection here. Maybe, you know, maybe what we're experiencing is, and I'll tell you what, Deepa, when I talk to kids who are millennial aged, they are really realistic about what's being truthfully told to them and what's not. They don't trust any of these institutions. And yet there are no good role models, at least in our community, of adults standing up and saying, you are right. <laughs> you know? okay. Instead, we're like kind of pretending that it's okay that you've got all this debt for school and it's okay that you graduate without a degree and it's your fault and you're not, you know, you're a lazy generation. I'm like, no, 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 no. We've handed down to you a terrible set of circumstances. And the truth, and when I tell these kids the truth or what I think is the truth, there's such this relief for them they, they want to put the world into order. You know, uh, Steve, so when we had the local, the climate protest here, the local climate strike, um, two of our writers and one of our, you know, videographer, they went there and it was just amazing how much, how inspired they were. I mean, they were kind of looking forward to this. So they went there, they, they interviewed and, you know, she came back and she wrote an op-ed on Young Zine about how that really impacted her and how it, you know, made her realize that you know, they are the citizens of the future and, and, and that, you know, they have the power, even if it's not through voting right now, it is being able to exercise their vote by being a voice. And, and so it's really, you know, I have hope because I think that the kids who are growing up today, I mean, they realize, they realize that we have messed up. You know, we, we see people like Greta and, you know, such inspiring young, young people out there. Um, and, you know, it, it's unfortunate we don't have, but I, but I think the key is to, you know, to not give up hope and to just continue to inspire them to, you know, um, really ask the right questions and ask us the hard questions. Because I think if you start building these skills in our kids, and I think a lot of what we're seeing today, and I feel that's what was concerned with media today is that because sensationalism sells, because these are for-profit organizations, we are sort of in this loop. But I think if we raise a generation that is going to start asking the hard questions, I feel like that is going to have to force change coming from media also. So that's kind of the other 
um, a thought that I had. So, Deepa, uh, historically, if if you if you look back at history, circumstances like this don't end well, right? Mm -hmm. High wealth inequality, high debt, um, you know, all kinds of markers of cyclic of the cyclical nature of history. So, you know, I kind of wonder, are we actually in a good place, right? I mean, it's like, if I want to be honest with kids, I'll say, you know, sometimes in history, there were very difficult times, right? If if the $200 trillion of, of stated and unstated debt come crashing down, you know, it may actually be really hard. And there's more to life than wealth. Agreed. And I think you're absolutely right. The, the, you know, the confluence of the kind of things we're seeing in the world today, whether it is climate change, whether it is rising inequality, whether it is, you know, struggle for, you know, freshwater resources. I mean, we are seeing, you know, fundamental things that we're taking for granted, you know, are, are not going to be uh, an issue. So you're right that it is cyclical and we are probably on the down, downward trend right now, but it is what it is and it's unfortunate, but it's our kids who are going to have to fix that. And so I think, you know, what we should be really doing is sort of equipping them with the knowledge and the skills because we have messed up. I, I really do feel that our generation has, there's been a sense of entitlement and, you know, we've really not, um, you know, there's this proverb that, uh, you know, I, I read maybe we're in Belize actually about how uh, you don't inherit your earth from your ancestors, but you borrow from your children. And, you know, it's one of those things that we've forgotten and we, we've had that sort of feeling of entitlement and we've done that. But I, I, I feel like we've got to now empower them with the skills that they need so that they, of course, recognize the reality of where we are headed, but they also have to be the ones who start bridging all the divisions and trying to find solutions, so. Yeah, and I, and I made a note when you were talking, you know, the, the, the caring adult, or maybe it was Leslie was talking, but you know, the caring adult is always at the heart of real education, you know, the mentored kind of taking you to a higher level. And so at some level, like I think about my own role as a parent, right? And it's like, I don't, what I'm trying to do is to help my kids build capacity. I'm trying to help them think better. And I'm trying to help them see things that I see and still recognizing they're individuals. And, you know, they, they were born with different temperaments and they have different skills and different talents. But I feel like it's not my job to tell them what to do. It's my job to help equip them to think deeply about it. So... See if, you, see if this resonates with anybody. I'm really concerned about all of the superhero movies. And I'll tell you why. It seems to me that they maybe reflect a culture that doesn't believe that regular people can solve problems. That the only way that things get solved is through superhero powers. And I thought, is that possible? Is it possible that that's, what, that's why they're so popular? It's the reflection that this is a, a generation that feels so disempowered that it says... Yeah, you know, you, you as a regular average human being, you're not going to do it. it. It takes a superpower. But hasn't that always been there, um, Steve? There always been superheroes for, you know. Well, so like, but when I was, yeah, I, I'm giving away my age, right? <laughs> but I can remember, I mean, I've always loved classic literature. And a lot of it is hard stuff, right? I mean, um, uh, Les Miserables, a lot of really hard things happen. And the story doesn't always end well. And people sometimes die never knowing their, the heroic nature of their lives. And, and some people make really bad choices. And it feels like, okay, if, if we don't tell stories about, if our stories don't tell about life in a way that's realistic, then are, are we creating a circumstance in which people just feel confused because we're not really saying, hey, you're actually capable of helping problems and it's going to take you 10 years of learning to get to a place where you could actually contribute to solving because you're going to have to learn about chemistry and you're going to have to learn about uh, physics and water flow and all this kind of stuff and that's hard and yes do it and know that it's going to be hard <laughs> that's the lure though i think you've just hit on the lure of the superhero genre the movies and and the power is they solve problems rather quickly I can just do my spidey sense and get rid of that person. I don't have to have a dialogue with that person. Or if, if I'm on, I don't have much background in this genre, but if, if I'm on the Starship Enterprise, I can use my ray gun 
and get rid of the enemy. I don't have to problem solve with that enemy. I don't have to engage in a dialogue. I don't have to take 10 years to solve a problem. I can do it in a laser light speed. And, and I think that that kind of simplistic view it is part of that lore too. Um, I really agree with that. I mean, it's uh, Sadipa, you lived in two different countries. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a degree to which uh, those cultures have narratives. So it was India and Kuwait. Yep. Right. So there are narratives that drive those cultures and their beliefs. And, and I can say that I don't believe the same things, mm -hmm. but somebody could look at my beliefs and say, well, they're just as non-scientific as the beliefs in somewhere else, in someone else's culture. And so at some level, we're all operating kind of on those names. And if, our, and if, if Helen, what you're saying is that the, sort of the current narrative is they, things get solved quickly without actually the, all the hard work. Well, that's a narrative I don't want my, for my kids. Right. And I was piggybacking off what you said because that's what sparked it with me. Yeah, it, I like that, that a lot. It's not this long discourse. It's not three cups of tea. I mean, it, it's, it's get in there. Yeah. And I worry a little bit that if our first response is blame and retribution, then our solutions are going to really be delayed. So I find that the, the tactic I use most in addressing complicated issues is I try and create a question that will elicit deeper thinking. Right? So some of you have heard me say this already today, but one of the questions I ask about schooling is what percentage of high school graduates in the U.S. graduate as competent adults? Mm -hmm. And that question tends to actually really raise a lot of questions for people, and I can then just sort of allow them to explore that. You know, another question I'll ask is, how many people have died in Iraq since we invaded? So the United States invaded Iraq, how many people have died? And when people actually start researching it and they find the numbers, they start asking really big questions. So I like the idea of well-formulated questions to help people begin to think about really complicated topics. I think just, just to mention perhaps that maybe a superhuman quality is the ability to travel across disciplinary bridges so to be able to think in a psychosocial manner, to be able to consider the public's sociological understanding of the sciences, especially around issues like um, climate change, of course. Um, being able to think about um, psychopolitics, sort of psychological aspects of uh, politics, which in respect of uh, fake news, et cetera, is, uh, is one of the key literacies. And that, that's the thing about the, the model there, that um, you can actually consider all of the literacies within that framework. So whether it's visual literacy, emotional, cultural literacy, and sort of spiritual, religious awareness. Um, so, yeah. Uh, socioeconomics, all, all of those uh, bridges uh, are there, so. I like that a lot, I do. Okay, that was terrific, how fun. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Can, can I add something? Uh, Please, Maha. Yeah, um, uh, the, 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 the most important point that um, you, we have been de you have been dealing with so far, it's the idea of uh, the change of mindset. Um, uh, People around the world have different uh, kinds of beliefs and aspects and, talent and uh, faith in different things. So uh, even if they don't like what's going on around them or if they don't uh, like what's going on around the world, again, uh, like uh, we have with Deepa here, the young Zin or with Helen or before with Leslie, uh, people are trying to do different things at different kinds of places. So uh, I believe that these are small pools of change that people are like to uh, are trying to help others to see, to become aware of what's really going around. So when people get together, finally, we find that we are all thinking in the same way. So it's not the idea of the superhero that we are looking for. We are looking for ch deeper change. Uh, okay. When we help people to understand, to become more aware on the long run, 
they are all going to be superheroes, not just looking for one superhero for a big kind of change. Yeah, I wish we had more time because I'd love to dive into that whole idea of the unique worth and value of the individual. Right. Because yeah. at least from my worldview, that's core. So it drives so much of my own personal thinking that any system that diminishes the individual is courting disaster. That ultimately, right. you have to do that. Okay, but we got to go because people got to go to the other sessions. Please stay in touch with me. I'd love to keep talking. We have one more of these. Uh, what is that? We have one more session tonight, too. We have one more session tonight. Okay, folks. Thanks so much, Peter, Deepa, Maha, Helen. Thank you very much. Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye. 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 Thank you.